Good morning. I hate to interrupt uh, your visiting, but uh, I've given you two extra minutes according to the clock up here, so uh, I do need for us to get started. Good to see you this morning in our class. Uh, we uh, are missing a few people. The weather is not real cooperative. I don't know what it was like in your house, but as we opened the door, it really just dropped out. And then by the time we got in the car, it eased up a little bit, so we got into the building much more easily than uh, we thought it might be. We're glad you're here, and I remind you that Jim is out of town today. He's preaching for the um, Centerville Church today, and they're doing a special 9-11 uh, service, and glad that he could be a part of that. I appreciate working with Jim. It's, it's really a, a good arrangement for both of us, and I enjoy him, and, and I think um, you are enjoying him, and I'm glad for that. He asked me last week if I had anything I wanted to add to his introductory lesson. Truthfully, I had two things, but I thought I'd just wait until today to, to do them. So before we get to the topic, let me mention two things that are just of a general nature. Number one, I'm delighted that we're finally able to get the text back in the quarterly. Um, and I just told Russell, I'm not gonna worry about putting it on the, on the screen anymore because you'll have it right there in front of you and it's easier to handle. I don't know about you, but with my copy of the text, I immediately go through and start underlining those words that are repeated so often. And in this text, there are several of those. And then I like to break down the text into the sections that we have the discussion on, just so that I know these verses are what we're gonna talk about first, and then these next, and so on. Just a minor thing, and yet it's awfully convenient for each of us as we study. It's a little hard sometimes to balance your Bible and the book, and you have them side by side, it's nice to have the text here. Now you still have to go to your Bible if you have some, uh, some passage that you're referred to. We have to do that. The second thing, uh, kind of historical note, uh, mythological note, uh, literary note, whatever you want to call it. With all the talk that we've had for the last few weeks about a new space shot called Artemis, I don't know if you looked up Artemis or if you remember who Artemis was, Artemis and Dinah are the same ones. Dinah is the Roman name. Artemis is the Greek name. Uh, she, it's two names, but it's one person. She was the daughter of Zeus and Leto and the twin sister of Apollo. In the King James Version, as you read the account in, in Ephesus, chapters 19 and 20 of Acts, we dealt mainly with 19 last week, but you go into 20 where we have the revolt of the silversmiths the riot in the city, the people are all crying out, great is Diana of the Ephesians, goddess of the Ephesians. The New American Standard will say, great is Artemis, the goddess of the Ephesians. It's the same person, but different culture. And that's true anytime you start looking at mythology, you'll have a set of Greek names, you'll have to have a set of, of um, Roman names. The other thing that's just a part of this story and this is tradition. Please understand this. this is not biblical. This is tradition. But the tradition says that at some point prior to all of this that we're dealing with in Ephesus, some large metallic substance fell out of the skies, landed near Ephesus. Those people in their superstition believed that Zeus had just sent their goddess to them. They built a temple around this piece likely it was a portion of some meteor that fell to the earth. That's not uncommon, but they worship that. And that's what the silversmiths were copying. If you can imagine this kind of chunk of coal and they turn it into a little silver uh, medallion, uh, much akin to people today who would wear crosses around their neck and that's fine. But for these people, it was a mark of their devotion to their goddess, the very one Zeus gave them. That's a pretty special thing. So that's just a historical note, but when you keep reading about Artemis, just think about Ephesus. Think about Paul's experience there and the letter that he wrote to that church. A nice little tie-in with current events and with some new kind of reality. Okay, those are the things that I would have said if I'd had the microphone last week, but, uh, and I did tell Jim afterwards, I said, I'm gonna talk to them about Artemis, but um, at any rate, I got to get in my two cents worth that I wanted to do. Okay, we begin the letter. You will notice that the title we've given this lesson is To the Saints. And that's a very special phrase that I want to deal with in just a moment. In the same way that Scott Sager introduced his study of Romans for us last week, 
I want to begin by introducing the letter to the Ephesians in much the same way. We need to know who the writer is. We need to know who the recipients are. And we need to know what the message is. And Paul covers that in his first two verses. He lets us know very quickly who wrote it, to whom he wrote it, and what he was writing about. So let's begin by looking at the text. What does Paul say first about the writer? Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ by the will of God, to the saints who are in Ephesus and faithful, and faithful in Christ Jesus, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ, redemption in Christ. Okay, what does Paul say about himself? He went again immediately by acknowledging that he is an apostle of Jesus Christ by the will of God. Paul is going to assert his role as being authorized by both Father and Son. This is not something he just dreamed up and he came in telling people some story. What he says here gives credibility, if we need it anymore, gives credibility to those three accounts that Paul gives in the book of Acts of his conversion on the road to Damascus. I don't know if you ever thought about it, but we know that's an important event. But it's particularly important to Paul who tells that story three times. What do we repeat most often? We repeat most often those things that are really meaningful for us or have a special tie with us or something that we just think is so memorable it can't be forgotten and we don't want anybody else to forget it. Paul is going to detail this story over and over. One other time he alludes to it in the little book of Galatians. And so in truth, in the Bible, we have four accounts of Paul's conversion. And so when he says, now I'm an apostle by Jesus Christ, by the will of God, don't question his authority. This is not just the man Paul who's talking, not just the writer Paul. Here's somebody who has authority by which he could speak. It's not something he chose for himself. We know that the word apostle means one cent. And Paul describes that one cent business as well as anybody I know. Because Jesus uh, tells him he's going to send him to the Gentiles. And he's going to send him to speak to kings. You'll appear before kings, Jesus says to him. And he does. So uh, here is one who is sent, not just sent, but sent with a message. So the writer is Paul. The recipients of this letter to the saints at Ephesus. The word saints is banded about in some wrong ways. Let me point out that in the Bible, saints are not dead. They are all alive. They are living. And Paul just as easily could have said to the Christians at Ephesus. He could have said to the chosen at Ephesus. He could have said to the saved at Ephesus, because all those words are synonymous with saint. A saint is somebody who has been set apart for something very special. By their obedience to Christ, they have connected themselves with him, identified with him, and they're going to do what he wants them to do. Truthfully, if you and I are doing what we know we should do, we are appropriately saints. And that's not some title that's tacked on, onto us several years after we've died and somebody decided we did something really special and we ought to be a saint. That's too late. Saints are living Christians. So to the saints, he says, to the saints who are at Ephesus, and then he gives them a second qualification, and faithful in Christ Jesus. Just leave out the place for a moment to the saints and faithful in Christ Jesus. To be a saint is pretty special, but to add to it that you are faithful to Christ Jesus, that's an added uh, verification of your importance in God's kingdom. Now I must insert here, uh, just to be fair about the whole thing, some manuscripts do not include the phrase in Ephesus. This is the only time Ephesus is mentioned in the letter, causing some people to believe this was not a letter specifically sent to Ephesus, but that it was a circular letter 
meant to be read by a number of churches. And we get that, for example, at the end of the Philippian letter, when Paul says, be sure you read the, this letter and the one I've sent to Hierapolis and let them have a copy of this one so they can read what I've written to you. There were letters that were designed for more than one church. And if he does not mention the name of the location, this could well have been a circular letter. A few manuscripts do insert the phrase in Ephesus, and so we've come to identify this as the Ephesian letter. By the very nature of its content, it was a letter that might could have been written, might have been written for any church. The one thing that sets it apart from all of Paul's other letters is that there's nothing personal in it. Paul had spent more than three years in the city of Ephesus, but when he wrote a letter to them, he didn't identify any individual that he remembered. He didn't recall any incident that happened there. That's not the purpose of the letter. The purpose is not to look backward and talk about what we did, it's to look forward and talk about what you're going to do. And so I think that forward emphasis adds a great deal of credibility to exactly what he is writing as well. So here is the recipient, or here is the writer, here are the recipients, the Ephesian Christians. We're gonna pick up that third thing in the next verse. What's his message? Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ, redemption in Christ. His message, grace, peace. Christians want to experience God's grace. We want to experience God's peace. But those are available only through our obedience to God's commands. He's going to give us what he's promised when we do what he's asked. And so you'll notice again, he be sure he certainly is insistent in getting in both God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. He identifies them as having much in common. In the same way John does in the first chapter of John, in the beginning was the Word, the Word's with God, the Word was God and goes on with all of those identification marks. Grace and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. And then almost as if it were an afterthought, he simply says, redemption in Christ. Not only do we enjoy the fatherhood of God, the Lordship of Jesus, we discover redemption there. The only way we can be saved is through Jesus. The writer of Hebrews will say, without the shedding of blood, there's no remission of sins. There is no other person whose blood could have been shed that would take away our sins. Only the blood of Jesus. What Peter will later call the precious blood of Jesus. It's very special. Going on then. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Christ. Just as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and without blame before him in love, having predestined us to adoption as sons by Jesus Christ to himself, according to the good pleasure of his will, to the praise of the glory of his grace, by which he made us accepted in the beloved. Okay, I'm going to play English teacher for just a minute. Okay? Notice in um, the second line of verse 1, the faithful in Christ Jesus. Notice down just a little bit farther, he's going to say, he chose us in him. We should be holding without blame before him in love having predestined us to adoption as sons by Jesus Christ to himself, according to the good pleasure of his will, to the praise of the glory of his grace by which he made us accepted and beloved. The in Christ, the in, uh, in whom we have all blessings. He talks about all spiritual blessings. We love to sing the song, Count Your Blessings, name them one by one. And we kind of make a real point of that song that we just, it would just be helpful to sit down and make a list of all the things I'm grateful for. But honestly, if we start making such a list, it's going to be primarily material blessings. And that's fine. You know, we're, we're grateful we have a good, meet, good meeting house. 
We're grateful we have good health. We're, we're grateful that we're able to get out and be about. We're, we're grateful for this or that or the other. But Paul doesn't talk about material blessings. He talks about all those spiritual blessings, all those things that sometimes we don't stop to appreciate. Sometimes they're harder to identify. What are my spiritual blessings? When we go back to the forgiveness of sins, redemption, that's a spiritual blessing. We talk about the answer to prayers. That's a spiritual blessing. We talk about grace. That's a spiritual blessing. And the list could go on and on. Every spiritual blessing is to be found in Christ. And as we go through the rest of this section for our lesson today, you'll see over and over, in Christ, in Christ Jesus, Paul wants to be sure these people understand that whatever they have and whatever they've learned, it originates with Jesus. What does he say to the apostles in the Great Commission? Go into all the world, preach the gospel to the whole creation. Or in Matthew's account, teaching them to observe all the things that I've taught you. All that I need to know, all that I need to do, all that I need to become can be found in the teachings of Jesus. And when I find myself more concerned with something that he didn't talk about, something he didn't direct me to do, I may be off the track. I may be headed in the wrong direction. Now, Paul's going to use some words here that kind of throw us off just a little bit. Uh, when we asked about the spiritual blessings for a moment, a moment ago, Every spiritual blessing is in Christ. What are those spiritual blessings? Again, the first one that Paul identifies in verse 4, he chose us in him. He chose us. And then Paul adds, before the foundation of the world. Does that mean before God created heaven and earth, he knew who you would be and who I would be and whether we were going to become Christian or not? No. He chose us in that broad sense. He made the decision that those who obey me are going to enjoy my blessings. It's a generic group, not a specific one. He chose us. And then in the next verse, he predestined us. And that's the word that gives us fits. We've let the Calvinist hijack the word predestination. What they teach is not what the Bible teaches. What the Bible teaches is that it is predetermined that those who obey God will receive the blessings. That's the predestination. It's not that God decided you'd be saved and you'd be lost because he gave us choices. We talk about that in the Garden of Eden. Adam and Eve had a choice. They could have obeyed or disobeyed and they chose to disobey. Regardless of whatever the motivation, motivating factors may have been, they chose to disobey, and they suffered for that. The very first psalm that we're familiar with, blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor stands in the way of sinners, nor sits in the seat of the scornful. What's David saying about that man? He gets to make choices. He chooses not to go in the way of the ungodly. He chooses not to sit in the seat of the scornful. He chooses not to walk in the way of the sinners. Those are the choices you and I have, among others. And when I act like I don't have a choice, I just had to do that, there's always a choice. Always. And so when Paul talks about our predestination, he's not talking about you and me in that sense uh, we were handpicked, but in the sense that we are a part of the family of God, the body of Christ, God said, those who obey my son will enjoy salvation. I think it's regrettable that Calvinism has done such an abusive thing to this doctrine of predestination. I've told this before, but like Ira North, if you've heard it before, don't say anything, I want to hear it again. But there's an old story about two pioneer preachers 
who decided on a particular Sunday they would swap pulpits. And as they made their way to the respective churches where each was to preach that morning, one said to the other, you know that before God created the world, he knew that today we would swap pulpits. And the other fellow said, no, I won't go. And he turned around and went home. Predestination is not going to go that far. And he just wanted to prove he had a choice in the matter. He could go or not go. And he chose not to go. That's the problem with making predestination such a personal experience. Now, continuing the thing about the in him, you'll notice how often do we have those, those phrases. And he chose us from before the foundation of the world. He made that broad choice that we should be holy and without blame before him in love. Holiness, blamelessness, love. Those are the qualities we're looking for. In the next section, verses 7 and 8, we're going to pick up the third thing that, uh, um, no, that one's coming a little later, sorry. This, this section we're going to talk about, uh, this uh, again, redemption. Because he had used the word redemption back in verse 2, just almost as an afterthought, redemption in Jesus. He comes back to that in verse 7. In him, we have redemption. It's not based on my works. It's not based on what I've done. In him, we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins, according to the riches of his grace. Why would Jesus die for us? Why would he pour out his blood? It's out of his love. It's out of his grace. He says to the people prior to his death, no one takes my life from me. I lay it down in my own accord. This is my choice. My choice is to shed my blood. And that blood was ser served to purchase the church and to cleanse the sins of every believer in whom we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins. And amazingly, all of that happens according to the riches of his grace which he made to abound toward us in all wisdom and prudence. Which he made to abound in us. Paul is saying if we'll take advantage of what Jesus has offered, we let that direct and guide our lives, then we will abound. We'll go more, we'll go farther. We will abound and all that he offers. Toward us in all wisdom and prudence, judgment, thinking wisely, carefully. And then it's in verse nine that we come back to that little list. I started earlier, what are the spiritual blessings? And I said, one of them is being chosen uh, and one of them is, is being adopted. Interesting that uh, Paul sees the, our role in the church. We are children of God by adoption because we're, we're not a part of that original family of God. We're not Jews, but we are adopted in. Just as Paul will talk in Romans about being grafted in. Well, it's a special situation that allows us to become a, a part of God's family. Verse 9 says, having, been na having made known to us the mystery of his will, according to his good pleasure, which he purposed in himself, that in the dispensation of the fullness of the times, he might gather together in one all things in Christ, both which are in heaven and which are on earth, in him. There's that again, in Christ, in him. But what does he do? He says, this, and this, this is where Paul introduces one of his favorite words, the mystery of his will. Paul is not talking about something that's unknowable. When you and I talk about a mystery, that's, that's when Shirley and I devote two hours, devoted two hours last night to an old Perry Mason movie trying to figure out the mystery. Who was the murderer? You know, mystery to us is something I haven't figured out yet. Paul explains to us that a mystery is something God already knows. He just hadn't revealed it yet. 
It's not unknowable, it just hadn't been revealed. And we have to wait until he opens it. So that's all a part of his mystery, the mystery of his will, according to his good pleasure, a phrase he's already used up there earlier. It's, it's almost like Paul is reminding us again and again, all of this is happening because God wanted it to, and he wanted to do, do it for us. He was pleased to do this kind of thing for us. And then he does, he introduces that third blessing, it's unification. He doesn't use that word, but he says, to gather together in one, all things done in Christ. One of the great themes in the book of Acts and in most of Paul's letters is that struggle to become one in Christ. The problem of bringing together a Jewish nation and Gentile people. How do you make one out of people who didn't speak to each other, who hated each other? Now that's a big barrier. He's going to bring them together into one. Paul will write elsewhere that he's going to break down that wall of partition which divides us. Paul is, all, is saying to us, you get the mental image, that everybody over here is Jewish and everybody over here is Gentile and somehow I want to bring you together and that can only be done in Christ. Not done because we're going to appeal to the law of Moses, not because we're going to deal with paganism, it's only in Christ. Bring together in one and again, all that bringing together is done in Christ, in Him. There's the unifying element. The unifying element was never the law of Moses. It was a great law for the Jewish people and it got them through a lot of troubles. But the only thing that we can be united in is going to be in the Christ Himself. He laid down His life to save all people. For God so loved the world, He sent His only begotten Son, that whoever believes in Him might have everlasting life. Not just so that the Jews who believe in Him, or so the Gentiles, but whoever believes in Him might have everlasting life. In Him, verse, 20, verse 11, in Him, since we have obtained an inheritance being predestined according to the purpose of him who works all things according to the counsel of his will. We've got some several, several hymns in there. Which one are you talking about? Well, the in him is Christ because that's what he's intended to say. In him we have obtained an inheritance. It's what he's given us. Being predestined, there again, that idea of God said, here are the circumstances, here are the requirements, here are the expectations, according to the purpose of him who works all things according to the counsel of his will, Jesus. In the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, the Word was God, the same was in the beginning with God, all things were made by him, without him nothing was made that has been made, God has given that kind of authority to the Son. And so we find in Him, again, all spiritual blessings. According to the counsel of His will, that we who first trusted in Christ should be to the grace of His glory. What do I owe the Lord? Trusting in Him, I can begin to see some of the glory that is rightly His. It's when I lose myself and I take him on. It's when I say no to self and yes to him that makes that kind of difference. Okay, we conclude our text by moving on to the last couple of verses. And notice how 13 begins, in him. You see how often that appears? It's a reminder, keep your eye focused on Jesus. In him you also trusted after you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, in whom also having believed, you were sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise, who is the guarantee of our inheritance until the redemption of the purchased possession to the praise of his glory. 
Everything you and I are doing is to bring honor and glory, as we often say, to both Father and Son. I want you to look carefully at 13 and 14 because Paul has just given us a miniature model of the plan of salvation. After you heard the word of truth, it starts with hearing. After you heard, faith comes by hearing, hearing by the word of God. After you heard the word of truth, which is the gospel of your salvation, let's just acknowledge it. Truth kind of puts it up here somewhere esoteric, but it is the gospel of your salvation. It's the means by which you receive forgiveness. The gospel of your salvation, in whom also having believed, we talk about the plan of salvation, it begins with hearing. Then it adds belief. And then we go on to repentance and confession and baptism. Paul skips over a couple of those. You heard, you believed, you were sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise. Where do we get the Holy Spirit? Jesus promised the Holy Spirit to the apostles in person. He's going to be with you. But when the spirit of truth comes, he will guide you into all truth. But according to the promise made to the people on the day of Pentecost, when you and I were baptized, we were sealed with the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit came to abide in us, to guide, to direct, to intercede, all a part of God's glorious blessings. And it's all done to the glory of Christ and to the glory of God. You heard, you believed, you were sealed. We get the idea of a seal, we think in terms of Greek and Roman correspondence. You finish a document and you roll it up and you seal it with wax. It's permanent, it's closed. Nobody else can look at it. You are sealed with the Holy Spirit. And then he makes the Holy Spirit real practical in another way. That Holy Spirit is the guarantee of our inheritance. Some have called the Holy Spirit the earnest payment. You know, when you buy a house, you have to put down some earnest money. It says, I'm committed to this. I will stand by my word. Well, the Holy Spirit becomes that earnest for us. He has sealed our promise. He becomes the guarantee of that promise. What Paul has done in this passage is to emphasize for us in a very unusual way the, inter the, inter the uh, intertwining of the roles of God and Christ and the Holy Spirit. And you'll notice how often here he, he does the thing that Scott Sager talked about last week in Romans. We get the full name of Jesus. He's Jesus Christ. Or he's Jesus the Christ. Or he's Christ the Lord. Let, let's be sure we understand who he is, what he is, give him due honor and praise and always glory that surrounds him. So, what do I do with a passage like this? Well, to begin with, I stand in awe at it. I stand in awe of what this message teaches us. Shirley and I were talking the other day about uh, something we'd been reading and from Paul, and I said, you know, Peter must have been reading that passage when he said about Paul, some of the things he writes are hard to understand. It's not that Paul is, is, is over our heads necessarily. He's just talking about things we don't want to think much about. We just rather kind of glide over it. He's there to make us think, to recognize the rationality of what we believe. What we believe. It's not vague and somewhere out in the sky. It can be reality. And Paul puts it in a very blunt blank language to let us know how important that is. I jotted down two or three things that I think are, are meaningful out of this lesson and we'll add those and then we'll conclude. The central emphasis in this passage is on Jesus, on, on God, and on the Holy Spirit. There's some rather key terms that are mentioned here. We talk about redemption, 
predestined, chosen, spiritual blessing, glory, inheritance. All of those words take on a much broader context for us when we look at this passage. I have to come to understand the meanings of certain words like saints and predestination and inheritance and mystery and sealed. When God made his promise to the children of Israel, he promised them a land flowing with milk and honey. He didn't promise the Christian a new dwelling place, a new land. He promised things far more meaningful, far more spiritual, not just a physical place. What do we know about this Ephesian church? Well, we know Paul was there for more than three years. We know about the riot of the silversmiths. We know about Paul's visit with the Ephesian elders on the island of Miletus. We know that this is one of the prison epistles. While Paul was in prison, he wrote Ephesians, Colossians, Philippians, Philemon, and 2 Timothy. And those letters are, are very personal in dealing with Paul's own experience. Because there is nothing personal in this letter, as I've suggested earlier, it may have been designed to be a circular letter, maybe for several churches, in much the same way we had the seven churches of Asia and letters were being passed around from place to place. Thank you for being here today. Um, Lord willing, Jim will be back with us next week as we continue our study of this Ephesian letter.